I think somebody starting out today and, uh, you know, we work with so many incredible young, young new managers. I think the best ones, I feel like, have a very specific niche and they go out and they become the expert in that niche. And so they know all the founders that are building in that vertical. They host dinners that they don't have to pay for. It's sponsored by somebody because they just hustle. They just develop this expertise, right? And actually, when we started ENIAC, it was mobile. ENIAC 1 and ENIAC 2, we were all building mobile startups. We're like, we're just investing in mobile software. That was our specific wedge. And obviously, now the mobile internet has become the internet, but we didn't become true generalists until Fund 3. Today, we had Nihal Mehta on the pod. Nihal is the co-founder of ENIAC Ventures. ENIAC is one of the top venture capital funds in the US. Through ENIAC, they've invested in over 10 unicorns. Before founding ENIAC, Nihal had built five tech companies. Some of them succeeded and some failed. People call Nihal the human Rolodex and Nihal is typically the life of the party. In this episode, we covered the founding story of ENIAC Ventures, pattern across 10 successful investments they've made, why communicating with LPs is a key for a successful fundraise, why it is important to manage your portfolio smartly, it makes sense to take some money off the table in secondary when your position is sitting at 100x so you can return capital to your LPs, who is the outsider of work and much more. Now I bring you Nihal. Nihal, so good to have you on the pod. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Nihal. Uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, and uh, maybe a good starting point, Nihal, could be what was the uh, the founding story of uh, ENIAC and, and what was the thesis behind it? What really convinced you uh, to launch a fund? Yeah, I mean, listen, I never wanted to be a, a VC. Like, I never grew up wanting to be a VC, that's for sure. Uh, it, when I hear the letter VC, I still kind of cringe as a founder. You know, as a founder, you're trained. VCs are vulture capitalists. They uh, they steal your company. They uh, they push you out. They they uh, give you bad ideas, all of which are very true <laughs> in general. Yeah. Um, so I never wanted to be a VC, except for us, by the way. I never wanted to be a VC. Um, but um, that was just the path that... Um, that I guess was was chosen for us, you know, uh, went to college uh, as an engineer and actually met three uh, buddies um, freshman year. So this was in 1995, 96, almost 27 years ago, who all had kind of similar careers, similar tracks coming out of college. We all ended up founding and operating a bunch of startups. Uh, we graduated in the late 90s, so the first dot-com peak. And... Um, you know, a bunch of those startups failed. Um, you know, we had a lot of muscle memory and scar tissue. My first startup went bankrupt. Um, and so um, I think through those experiences, uh, and by the way, some of them, of course, were successes as well. But through those experiences, um, we fell in love with that zero to one stage of the business. And off the successes started, started to angel invest um, and then decided to do it together. And formed the fund in 2009. So that's now, you know, 14 years ago. ENIAC 1 was, uh, was launched in 2010, vintage 2010. It was a whopping $1 million. Uh, it took over a year to raise from LPs, 10K, 20K checks. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and now here we are, you know, uh, wrapping up ENIAC 5, which is a $125 million vehicle. But that's how we kind of fell into, into venture. Got it. And Nihal, uh, what has been your portfolio construction been uh, and how did you come up with it? Has it evolved over the years from fund one to fund uh, five today? This I give all the credit to uh, my partner Hadley. Um, when somebody mentions portfolio construction to me, I, I instantly get sleepy um, and my eyes kind of glaze over uh, and I start snoring. Um, <laughs> my, my uh, the, the the nice thing about our partnership, you know, there's four of us, is that um, each of us kind of has this distinct kind of passion area slash superpower. And so, you know, my part the, my partner Hadley kind of runs strategy, which includes um, portfolio construction. And to his credit, from the beginning, we we constructed ENIAC even in a one million dollar fund um, 
to be about half uh, follow-on. Um, now, of course, in ENIAC 1, the initial checks were 25K. We weren't able to do the pro rata, you know, through the Series B, whatever it was, with a $1 million fund. But the idea was to create enough of a framework that we could just scale that up. So if you add a couple more zeros to it, it looks similar. And and that's end, actually ended, what ended up happening. You know, we wanted to create a... Um, basically like a, a track record and, and an example that, that we could scale it. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and we did. So now ENIAC 5, like I mentioned, 125 million, about half of which is initial. The other half is follow. The follow means we will do the pro rata, uh, ideally through the Series B. Uh, so protect that ownership. We try to enter in a double digit ownership. That's one thing we've learned in the past 14 years that, um, you know, double down on the things you can control if you can control ownership then then you should and mm-hmm. you're putting your all your might and all your energy and all your firm's resources in investment so you might as well um have the ownership uh to uh you know th- that will reward you when these companies do well and so uh anyway uh that's how these funds are constructed um the initial check we get to about at least 10% ownership and then protect that in the series A and series B and half the fund is reserved for follow. Mm-hmm. Got it. And Nihal, it's a, it's a completely different game from, you know, writing 25K checks to leading rounds or co-leading rounds. How has the journey been for you uh, in that lens? Yeah, that was a big transition for us. And that was around, I'd say, ENIAC 3. So probably like five years into the fund around 2014, 2015, um, we basically went from a, hey, let's put in 25K in fund one or 250K in fund two, you know, behind a strong seed investor, which, by the way, is a great strategy, um, right? For, for small seed funds, it's like basically, you know, make sure you're really good friends uh, and spend a lot of time with like 10 to 15 seed funds that you really admire catch up with them weekly. Like a lot of the seed funds, pre-seed funds that we're friends with, they just come to our office in Soho and sit down and they're like, give me your deals, you know, and we're happy to share Uh, because these folks are hungry and they hustle and they really work hard for these companies. And for us, when we're leading around 250K, 25K, there's usually room around the syndicate. We're never more than half the rounds. Um, But anyway, so that was, that was easier, right? Because you have 15 seed funds that you catch up with regularly when somebody drops a term sheet, you kind of drop your 25 or 250K commitment in behind them. Mm-hmm. Now, leading was a different muscle. It took us kind of like two years, I'd say, one to two years of transition period. That's a, that ENIAC 2 to ENIAC 3, where we ended up um, now developing the new muscle, which is um, let's do our own work. Let's create our own memos. You know, let's hire people that complement us within ENIAC. Who, can, who are experts at that analysis and that diligence, who can help us put together the memos, take these things to ground. And most of mm-hmm. all, what this all points to is developing your own conviction, right? Your own first party conviction, mm-hmm. not third party conviction, right? Everybody has third party conviction in this space. Everybody's a, a follower, right? We're all like VCs are notoriously known for the herd mentality. Like if Sequoia drops a term sheet, oh my God, like everybody wants to do it, right? Um, but developing your own first party conviction, right? I feel like that is really like coming into age as a venture capitalist. And so your, your own first party conviction. Um, and so that was us in ENIAC 3. And when we started doing that, I'd say midway ENIAC 3, things really changed. You know, we optimized for ownership. Um, we ended up leading some spectacular deals. You know, we have um, three unicorns and counting right now that we led the seed in in fund three. Um, that fund's doing phenomenal. And I, I think it's because of that time that we took to really develop our first party conviction and lead. And then, you know, since then, um, it's been um, all in the rear view mirror. I mean, we've been leading since then, right? ENIAC 4, ENIAC 5. Um, we like to send our own paper, develop our own conviction, use our own network to get to that conviction, and then develop the syndicate and obviously help the smaller funds, you know, with the 25, 250K checks. Uh, you know, ride along, right? If they can show their value. Got it. And Nihal, uh, maybe let's talk about uh, three aspects of investing, which is, uh, you know, sourcing, uh, p- 
picking and winning, you know, over the last 14 years, I'm sure you as a team have grown and developed. How have you, uh, you know, over the years learned and got gotten better at all three aspects? Yeah, I mean, Shiva, actually, there's a fourth aspect that's really important. And it's really important in this market more than ever. And that's actually managing yeah. these positions. So, so that means um, taking liquidity when you should be through secondaries. Um, you know, optimizing returns for your LPs. And I think a lot of VCs forget that. Uh, so I'll come back to that. But sourcing, um, picking slash winning um, and uh, accelerating, right, uh, is, what you ma- is what you mentioned. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then obviously managing. So um, I'll touch on each area. I think sourcing, we're actually working on um, improving internally right now we've been lucky as founders myself and my partners that all of our deals are inbound um every month we've been very fortunate we have thousands of deals that come in through the network um through warm intros through cold intros and um majority of the deals we invest in are through inbounds um mm-hmm. and so i think we are leaving some stuff on the table like we're trying to develop an outbound engine right and so we have some junior investors that are now focused on that and i think that's only going to help like now that we're all based in new york city uh we used to be bi-coastal new york sf we still have great phenomenal companies in sf we always will sf is still the tech mecca um all of our headcount is in new york and so we do not want to miss a new york seed a hot new york seed deal and so of course they're not all going to come in inbound so we need to outbound some of those so we need to work on that um I think the second component, the picking and the winning, like our judgment, I think the picking part has gotten a lot better because the folks that we've hired, um, as I mentioned, to help us with diligence come from that kind of analytical background. So they're coming Mm -hmm. from places like Goldman and Point Seventy Two and JP Morgan, where, um, you know, they really bring that DNA to help complement us, uh, to help us with judgment and picking. We utilize our network a lot as well. Uh, in the diligence um, phase of the business. And that actually helps bring signal into uh, an investment decision. Uh, and then when we decide, you know, that we want to invest, um, we deploy a win game, you know, which is um, the best win game is, hey, listen, like talk to any of our founders, like especially talk to founders that have not been successful. Yeah. And you really learn a lot from founders, um talking to other founders um, where, um, you know, you know where people stand when things are good and when things are bad, right? And uh, so we tell any founder that we end up committing to, please talk to founders. We're happy to make intros, go behind our backs. Um, And then, of course, really working hard to understand their business and provide intros to them that are pivotal to their business. Mm -hmm. You know, I I like to call them game-changing intros. So imagine serving up a Fortune 10 customer um, to literally the decision maker, the buyer, the budget for a company that we're in diligence with. Like that's a dream for any founder, right? Uh, and we remember that as founders, how impactful that was for us. So that's how we try to win. Um, after they become an investment, you know, we're developing a platform uh, where we can accelerate. And essentially, the accelerate is all about getting companies through product market fit. You know, at seed, that's our objective is to get these companies through product market fit, raise a series A. So that is a lot of customer discovery, biz dev, sales, recruiting, PR, product distribution, and then of course, working really hard to raise the A. So we're oftentimes running these companies fund fundraise process. So that's the pitch deck, that's um, the pipeline, that's the pitch feedback, that's the negotiation of the term sheet, and then of course, um, getting the deal done. Um, Got it. And then the fourth piece, which a lot of people forget, is managing. You know, um, we were lucky a couple of years ago uh, to take some chips off the table at the peak. But like, the, you know, investors need to understand that their obligation is to create returns for LPs. And while it might be tempting to like hold a, an incredible company for a very long time, um, and some managers do that, it's prudent to return these funds. You know, it's prudent to, we have 5X targets for all these funds, um, and it's prudent to figure out how to get there. And, you know, Fred Wilson, who's one of our mentors, has this great post from, I don't know, 15 years ago, which is like, 
anytime an investment passes a billion dollars in value, you got to sell 15%. We have a different kind of formula, which is anytime an investment is a fund returner, mm -hmm. that's when we sell. Um, and we don't sell all, we still hold the majority, but we sell enough to create DPI. And I think that's really important, especially in these in this environment, this down market. Got it. And Nihal, maybe double clicking on picking. Uh, you have a fantastic track record. I think you got uh, more than 10 unicorns or 10 unicorns in your portfolio. We can talk about some of the non-obvious uh, pattern you've seen across all these uh, you know, highly successful companies in your portfolio when you were picking. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think we're in the business of outliers, you know, so uh, by saying there's a pattern is is probably a little, um, you know, a little, a little uh, misleading. But um, we know, like, when we see a founding team, what we like, um, we like a full stack founding team, if possible. So the, the, the co founding team can build ship and sell the product within themselves, right. And that's usually two or three co-founders. Uh, ideally, they've worked together before um, and maybe even failed before because we like to say when you've had your hands around each other's necks and you want to do it together again, that means the world, right? You want to de-risk kind of founder chemistry. That is the number one startup killer at the earliest stage. And if you can de-risk that by finding co-founders that have worked together before and have been through the trenches and been through the peaks and the valleys, then you de-risk that aspect. So, um, you know, those are two things that we look for. I mean, if, if there's a, a very strong co-founding full stack team that can build, ship and sell, and they've done it to together before and they've had a small outcome, so they're not like uber rich and lazy, mm -hmm. but they say, I, we all like to say they, you know, they bought the house, they're still paying the mortgage, right? They're still mm -hmm. hungry. Yeah. Or, I mean, ideally the mission is far greater than economic, right? Mm -hmm. the, the mission is, the extreme is Elon Musk, like I'm creating interplanetary, you know, like human life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm saving Earth. Like those missions are very grand. Um, every amazing founder has a mission that's as grand as that to them in a very small niche. And so um, being able to see that right is also really important. You got it. And you have, along the way, uh, you, you, you came across a few you misses as well, uh, I think. Pinterest that I've known of, uh, could be square. Uh, are there any learnings or it just, uh, yeah. <laughs> learnings yeah. from those misses. Yeah. I mean, listen, if, if you don't have a good shadow portfolio, you're not doing your job, right? Um, that means you're not in the, you're not at the table. Like that's, that's actually even, a, even a worse, um, situation when you don't see the deal, right? At least you see the deal and pass on it. There's so many companies that we passed on, um, or, or didn't, didn't get to conviction on or didn't get to invest in, but we saw, right? You mentioned Pinterest and Square. Hugging Face is a big one too of this generation. Um, yeah. We actually were Hugging Face's first term sheet. That's our claim to fame in the shadow portfolio. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think we constantly iterate. We're engineers. And I think what we realized in the past is that ENIAC was very consensus decision oriented where every partner basically the the firm had to get the consensus to do an investment and we realized that information um is largely asymmetric even though we have great communication um that that if their information bias is still there the, the partner or the team member that's closest to the founders is going to have the greatest information and so if they get to conviction then that's then that's very important that is the most important thing right and so we call it partner conviction instead of consensus to Conviction, and that's by the way how most venture funds are run, right? Anyway, especially at the later stages. So, um, I think as soon as we shifted that, it's given more freedom for any partner to say, you know, I think we're going to run at this, we're going to run at Pinterest, we're going to run at Square, we're going to run at Hugging Face. Doesn't matter price. Like I, I believe in it, and mm -hmm. I think um, hopefully that can solve um, some of that, and 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 maybe enable us to move some of the things from shadow into the actual real portfolio. Uh, yeah. But that was a change that we implemented a few years ago, and I, I think that's going it's going well. Got it. And Nihal, uh, what's the hardest part about will building a venture fund? Or maybe you can talk about some uh, you know non obvious or less discussed uh, aspects about building venture uh, capital fund. Yeah, I mean, you know, 
venture capitalists are notoriously bad at managing their own team, right? This is like a kind of an eat what you kill business. Um, like traditionally, a lot of investors were not CEOs prior. They were not operators, so they don't know how to, you know, they just don't have the, the muscle memory to like build teams, like motivate teams, create growth paths for teams, do OKRs and KPIs and really, you know, enable your team to, to operate at their full potential, right? Either at your firm or after. And that's incredibly important. Like this is an apprenticeship business. Um, and so I think that is, you know, an aspect that a lot of people forget um, as you grow a, as you grow a firm, that is your startup. And mm -hmm. you need to apply energy internally to your team. And um, one of the things I mentioned, you know, Hadley runs uh, strategy. Uh, my partner, Tim, does a great job running the team. And so he spends a lot of time. Everybody has a skills matrix and OKRs and reviews. And that takes a lot. I mean, we're 12 people. That takes a lot of time. Like now we're in review season. It's December uh, coming up. And so, um, you know, this is like, I don't know, half of his time. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of firms forget that we have a coach that works with us to help us manage uh, the reviews that help us work uh, together, um, you know, uh, on on uh, initiatives at the GP level and 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 runs our offsites and all that. But I think a lot of folks forget that, um, you know, VCs are startups, too, and that you really have to apply a lot of energy internally on your mm -hmm. team. And if you neglect that, then your team is not going to grow. Like your startup is not going to grow, right? So that's incredibly important. It's easy when it's just like four of you, like everybody's a GP, but when you have other layers, now we have, you know, 12 folks. I don't think we're going to grow much bigger, but uh, even then you want everybody to operate at their potential. You want everybody to grow into a bigger role. And so making sure that you, you know, provide that energy and that path is incredibly important. Okay, interesting. And uh so from fund one, uh, which was 1.6 uh, million, I believe, to you know fund five, it's 125. You've had a successful journey, uh, Nihal, in fundraising, and recently you had a uh, you hosted an event where you invited a bunch of fund managers, emerging fund managers, NLPs, and one of your points you discussed, you know, try to over communicate with LPs. Maybe you can paint a picture what that means uh, through an example. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things we wanted to do is really help. Uh, we always want to do this. Obviously, we remember when we were small and growing that this was the best help a GP could get is with LP intros and LP strategy on fundraising. And so, you know, right now we're helping, I don't know, about 50, 50 other firms um, get raised. And, um, we, we hosted an event, to your point, with some of our uh, best LPs and these managers. And one of the things that came out from it was that, you know, LPs are like, listen, like, basically, like, we're people too. Like, put, you know, put the P back in the LP. We're a partner. And so what do you what do you do with your partners? You communicate. Like, uh, you know, we have our best LPs, actually, majority of our LPs on um, on text, right? And we're, we're texting with them all the time. Like, they're our partners in business. A lot of them are curious on very specific companies. A lot of them are like, hey, um, you know, are you going to run the marathon again? I want to run with you type of thing, right? You become friends anyway. That communication um, is key. And I think one of the things that GPs forget, I think one of the points that, that was expressed <clears throat> that really resonated was, you know, GPs should feel confident to say, listen, like, um, we're trying to go out next year. Like, what is the likelihood of you participating in my fundraise? Like just being very straightforward, right? Um, and um, LPs are often very impressed by how persistent you are because it shows you how you run your business, right? You send one email to an LP and say they don't respond, which by the way, a lot of people don't respond to emails. They get tons of emails all the time. And then you feel like, oh, the LP is ignoring me. It's a pass. Like, guess what? Like your email may have gone to spam. Guess what? Like, maybe it's not read. Guess what? Maybe it was read and there was a draft waiting to be sent that never got sent. So be persistent and don't feel bad to over communicate and be over persistent and ask the hard question. Like, do you think I'm going out next year? Do you think this would be a fit for you? If not, cool. Like, I'll catch up with you in three years. 
you know, uh, like for the next fundraise, obviously I wouldn't develop a relationship with you in between. Um, but, um, but let's be straightforward and let's, and let's over communicate instead of under communicate. I think that was the, that was the spirit there. Got it. And Nihal, uh, if someone is looking to, uh, take the journey that you've been on for the last 14 years, uh, looking to start a fund, launch a fund, what advice, uh, would you give, uh, to that person? Or maybe let's flip it. Like what? are the things that they should not be doing. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I never knew that it would take this long um, to, uh, to one, make money, <laughs> but to, uh, like, to actually see, you know, like, the, the, a lot of these seed funds now last, like, 15 years, you know? It's a long horizon. Uh, companies are staying private a lot longer. Look at Stripe, it's still private. Um, and um like i did not know that i did not know it'd be a it'd be like that kind of kind of knife fight you know um for such a long period of time um mm -hmm. i think the startup horizon if you found a startup is actually much shorter than like a venture part right um these things just take a lot more time especially at seed um and so i think somebody starting out today and uh, you know, we work with so many incredible young, young new managers. I think the best ones, I feel like, have a very specific niche that they're very passionate about, and they go out and they become the expert in that niche. And so they know all the founders that are building in that vertical. They host dinners that they don't have to pay for. It's sponsored by somebody because they just hustle, and they just develop this expertise, right? And actually, when we started ENIAC, it was mobile. ENIAC yeah. 1 and ENIAC 2, we were all building mobile startups. We're like, we're just investing in mobile software. That was our specific wedge. And obviously now the mobile internet has become the internet, but um, we didn't become true generalists until Fund 3. And so I think that's something that it's very hard to start a fund and, and be a generalist. But if you start a fund and focus on a very specific niche. So, for example, this amazing woman um, runs Maya runs Spice Capital and she started in Web3, but also kind of Gen Z and consumer, right? And that's like niche enough today to develop a great, uh, phenomenal founder group, portfolio, sub portfolio, momentum. And that just creates a snowball effect where you then get better and better found. You trap, you fly paper, you trap better and better founders in those verticals. And eventually those are going to lead you to the next incredible deals, right? Um, it doesn't have to be a vertical. It could also be a geo. You know, like New York is still underserved from an early stage capital perspective, for example. A lot of LPs just have a just have a thesis. We want to back New York focus funds. Let's go. And your manager, like I'm early stage New York. A lot of great funds that um, have gotten raised recently with just with that specific thesis. They're generalists, but they're New York, New York founders. You know, climate obviously is growing very quickly. Um, I think mixed reality with Apple Vision Pro next year is going to be really interesting, right? I know we saw the mixed reality funds in back in the day, maybe they come back. But anyway, my point is have a very specific vertical and wedge, develop yeah. an expertise, become a leader. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about you when they talk about that space mm -hmm. and they're going to attract the best founders and the best LPs who are going after that space. Got it. Yeah. Maya is great, by the way. I've known her for some time now. And yeah, you're right. Uh, in the in the beginning, have a niche and nail it, build a brand around it, and then uh, build on top of that. And yeah, with this, we'll switch gears. Uh, my co-pilot in the back, uh, his name is Alfonso, and, uh, and he wants to get to know you outside of work. Uh, typically, uh, what's, you know, what's your day like from... You know, waking up to going to bed. Yeah, good question. I, you know, I think routine is really important. Rhythm is really important. New York is also very intense where like literally if you want to turn it on, you can do like 20 meetings a day, you know, like literally um, this is the city of like ambition and energy and everybody here in any career uh, is just trying to get better. And so there's kind of unbridled ambition here. And that's, you know, why we live here. It's, you know, best city in the world. Uh, no offense, listeners, uh, come and visit and stop by our office. Um, but um, yeah, I got two boys. Uh, I'm a, a blessed dad. They're eight and three. And so the morning is uh, 
you know, usually uh, I'm woken up by the three year old punching me in the face. Um, and then uh, I uh, try to take one of them to school. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I exercise, you know, in the morning. Um, I love running. Um, I have a group, a run group called Pitch and Run. We started four years ago. Founders and investors um, that meet on the West Side Highway every Monday and Friday, at 9 a.m. And sometimes these groups are as big as 100 people. And it's an incredible way to just exercise outside in the sun with other people talking about, venting about, um, you know, your industry and uh, trying to help other people out kind of like an open office hours, but also while getting exercise is great. Um, then uh, get ready for work, get to the office. Um, and I like to spend the days, I say, in sync time. So email is an async function. Like you can catch up on email kind of all hours of the day. It's good for nights and weekends um, or planes, you know, uh, to catch up on. It's not really that useful during the day. During the day is really meant for this one-on-one -on -one time and ideally IRL one-on-one -on -one time. And so like today I'm looking at my schedule of like eight even meetings at the office. Um, uh, and, um, I, you know, I love those meetings. Those are predominantly, I try to prioritize founders, um, either existing founders or new founders. Um, and then, uh, after work, try to do a more casual meeting, maybe like a drink or early dinner with, uh, you know, more, um, kind of tech or, or friends community. And then, you know, get home before kids bedtime. Um, to put the kids to bed and basically rinse and repeat, you know, ideally going to bed, um, you know, I have this whoop, which uh, mm -hmm. helps me stay in the green. Um, okay. Part of it's psychosomatic, but I think part of it is also um, is working. And if I can stay in the green, then I can kind of operate at my potential every single day. And so for me, that means um, going to sleep before 11 p.m. and then, you know, waking up around seven. So getting that eight hours of sleep. Um, getting that exercise done in the morning again before work and, um, you know, trying to eat also dinner be before 8 p.m. So I try to eat between 12 and 8, I guess, okay. intermittent fasting, um, whatever uh, trend it might be on. But that that's what works best for me. Um, but that that's my day. Um, I can do this all day long. You know, it's kind of set up for a... Um, like a, a, a long lasting kind of path, right? Because it's a little bit of everything. You got your kids, your family, you got your your exercise, you got a ton of IRL time with mm -hmm. with your team and with founders. Um, and then occasionally have to sprinkle in a date night for that early dinner. Um, mm -hmm. you know, with with your wife. Otherwise, um, you won't stay married. So those are important. <laughs> Yeah, those are very important. Well balanced. Uh, it's like Whoop is helping you out. By the way, Whoop has made its way uh, to India. Virat Kohli has been uh, wearing it. And uh, uh, Nihal, uh, you know, we know you as a as a tech entrepreneur, investor. What do your friends know you for? Who are you outside of work? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I don't know. I think they would probably. We're very lucky to have a very strong group of friends. Also, largely from undergrad and. Um, we get together all the time. We're planning ski trips right now. They're all over the world. We're planning ski trips, you know, um, mm -hmm. early next year. Um, but um, I don't know. I'd say a lot of them would know me as the flip cup, the reigning flip cup champion. I've, I've held the number one ranking for, I don't know, over 20 years with my friends. It's a, um, it's a drinking game, whether it's alcohol or non-alcoholic beer, um, your choice. But uh, I'm very good at flipping cups. Um, uh, I don't know. I think, you know, the energy in the network, um, which I also bring to my work, uh, mm -hmm. is consistent in my friend group as well. Um, you know, friends are uh, like anything else. They take energy to um, maintain those relationships. And I think, you know, a lot of people forget that. Uh, I think a lot of also men forget that, that um, there's this loneliness epidemic I was reading about. Um specifically post COVID in mm -hmm. older men where we don't necessarily put in that energy to maintain those relationships. My wife's going on girls trips all the time and um, guys don't really do that. And uh, I think it's really important, uh, especially at this age when we're unique individuals, we have 
so many roles as a husband and a father that you need peers to like just mm -hmm. hang with, vent to, hug, cry on, whatever it might be. And um, for whatever reason, we're not like vulnerable like that, right? Um, and so anyway, I think it's really important to put that energy into those trips and those keep those relationships um, very lively and very active. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I forgot his first name, Murthy. I think he was the uh, chief surgeon uh, officer for uh, Vivek. Vivek, yeah. So he, he wrote a book on this topic called Together. And I'm hearing good uh, things about the book. And yeah, one last one. Uh, if you were to pick one superpower, uh, you know, for, for your partners, uh, Tim, Vivek, and Hadley, uh, even they might know about those superpowers. What would they be? Yeah, I mean, we, we actually very deliberately kind of organized our functions across the firm to line up to our superpowers. Um, I mentioned Hadley is maybe the most like logical of us four. He spends time meditating and um, he's just very objective. And I think like strategy is a really good superpower for him. Um, he also helps us with kind of quality control on investments. Um, because of his objectivity. Um, I think Tim has, uh, like I mentioned, done an incredible job with the team. He's, he's very good with people. Um, he's very kind of, you know, he gives that kind of objective advice as well that can be stern at times to get, to, to provide feedback to folks to improve. Um, that's something that I'm definitely not good at. Um, Vic is an incredible visionary. And so, um, he's helped us kind of lead these, in, these new, um, like the charge in brand new spaces just this week, for example, he released an entire open source artificial intelligence, uh, market map. And, uh, he did that with web three. He did that with autonomous robots. He did that with quantum computing. He's really pushing the envelope in terms of vision yeah. and helping us really forge new spaces with new understandings. So really appreciate that. Um, and then, you know, as you know, I'm kind of the, you know, the people guy, the network, um, building community, whether it's through Pitch and Run or through the tech community, uh, leveraging our network at ENIAC to help with um, sourcing and due diligence and acceleration of companies. Um, and that's where I get my energy, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's for sure a superpower that I've, uh, you know, I've realized and, um, and applying it to the firm, it enables ENIAC to have that superpower as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the important thing to remember in life and especially uh, in VC is you can't be everything to everybody. Um, double down on your strengths. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that way you can kind of carve that niche in the universe. Right. And um, and uh, I think we're doing a good job of that, a better job of that now than we ever have before, with at least every co-founder of the firm applying their superpowers, you know, in the right way. Got it. And also high energy uh, that you have uh, that comes across as well. And Nihal, I uh, would love to add, are, are you still DJing these days? <laughs> uh, I, have, I do have my turntables out. Uh, unfortunately, they're collecting dust. Um, but um, I'm available for hire at any eight-year-old birthday party. That's, that's, <laughs> what I'm that's what I'm relegated to now. <laughs> Got it. Love it. Uh, Nihal, Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you for making the time coming on the pod. I had uh, so much fun uh, and chatting with you. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me and, and staying up late out in Delhi. And um, whatever I can do to be helpful, I'm accessible on Twitter, at Nahal, at Nahal Mehta, um, and also email, Nahal at ENIAC.vc. Uh, we do actually respond to every single email, not immediately, not sync during the day, but eventually. Uh, and, you know, my job, my mission is to try to help every founder that we meet, whether or not we invest.